So we made our escape from the Sail River yesterday um, and on the ebb tide that pushed us out of the river and then it pushed us north really well here in the Kimberleys the tides go north and east on the going out tide, the ebb tide and south and west on the flood tide so we used that ebb tide, we got all the way up and we nearly got into the bay and then we didn't quite catch it, the tide changed and sort of gave us a bit of a touch up yesterday um, so we anchored further out last night um, and now we're going into Deception Bay. I think that was named in the early explorers, some of the early encounters with the Aboriginals. They, uh, they went and met them, had friendly hollows, um, and then there was a bit of trouble with them, so they, they felt deceived. We're gonna go in now, there's a, bit of a, there's a bit of a creek there that looks like we might be able to catch a fish or something like that. The scarves agitating for a mud crab, so we better try and see what we can do there. Um, and the cruising guide says it's a favourite place of whales, so... Ah, there's another boat in here! Oh. Quick, get out! <laughs> Admittedly, it's only... It's, uh, a yacht. Yeah, it's another yacht and it will be a couple of miles away, so I think we can sort of tolerate the intrusion this time. Um, Alright, so the wind has come up and rather than stay here in Deception Bay, we've decided that we want to go to a place we, we've seen and we know that we like, where there's fresh water, there's fresh fish, there's fresh oysters, it's fresh everything. So while there's a fresh wind, we're going to bail. We've left Deception Bay and we're making good ground. We're going about six and a half knots uh, with a broad reach and there's a westerly wind blowing. But shortly we're going to be turning east, so Troy's popped out onto the deck and he's setting up the spinnaker. We're going to set that up ready for when we go downwind our first spinnaker run in the Kimberley. Here's the Spanish mackerel that we caught this morning and we're going to make a grav lax or what we like to call a grav max because it's mackerel which is a cured uh, product that will cure in the fridge for about mm, three to five days. So the way that the product is cured is that you place the curing mixture over the skin and over the flesh and then you put two pieces together and you sandwich them on top of each other and you essentially squeeze or, or with pull all the moisture out of the product and you end up with a really nice cured um, fish. Got the filleting knife here. Just remove a little bit more of the bloodline there. We've cut the fish and now we're ready to cure it. And this is a container that I've prepared for curing the fish in. We've got some two bits of tube matting here that will keep the fish elevated so that when the liquid pours off the fish we'll be able to pour it away from the fridge. This is our curing mixture. It's a quarter of a cup of ground rock salt, a brown, quarter of a cup of brown sugar, a couple of pinches of dill seeds and a good few twists of cracked black pepper. And it smells really, really good. I think it's going to make really nice smelling, really nice smelling product. Do you want to smell it, Troy? Whoa. Yeah. It's good, huh? That smells wild. Alright. And just sprinkle it on the skin. Just rub it like that. Now we're going to splash some gin that we saved. Especially for this. Saved, you mean hid it from hid. me? <laughs> Especially for this <laughs> event. 
You can use vodka or any white spirit, but we're using gin, so just do a splash on each. Whatever you two can hide from your loved one. <laughs> so I'm putting this on quickly before the alcohol slides off down into the tray. Have you already seasoned those pieces? Or? No, they've got seasoning in the middle there. So. They've got enough. Yeah, I'll put some on the top, and then what we'll do is the first few lots of the juices that come out, we'll rebaste the fish with them. This is going to go in the middle section of our fridge. We've got another container with our yogurt, our sprouts, and some other fish fillets. That, that will sit on top and press down onto the fish like that. So I'll show you in the fridge now. So as you can see, this is pretty small fridge. This is our only refrigeration on the boat. It's a 40 litre angle that we use for refrigeration only. So, I mean, if you're out in your, if you're camping or you have a caravan with a fridge or you're four wheel drive with a fridge, it's possible to do this if you've got catch of fish and you've got excess fish and you're not going to eat it in the next couple of days. It's possible to do this um, and have your very own cured product when you're out and about remote traveling. All right, so that's going on top like that. I'm gonna push it down like that. And then we're gonna start putting the stuff in to keep it weighted down. So weight is an important part of this process? Yeah, weighting it down is really important to push down all of the moisture from out of the fish. How often are we going to have to come and check and uh, baste this product? I'm thinking just in the morning and at night before bed for so three days. It's, it's not going to demand much? No, attention. just twice a day. Cool. Whenever really. Whenever. Yeah. So this is, the, uh, this is the lure that got the mackerel that just made that grab max then. So a lot of people look at lures as consumable items, you know, that they're going to lose them. But uh, we like to rig them up properly and they get a lot of use. This has obviously put a lot of food on the table. Look at the damage done to this thing. This Gravlax recipe brought to you by Halco Laser Pro LP190. Well, it's been a bit of a busy morning here in Hanover Bay. This is our second day here. Uh, we're going to catch the tide and go and water the boat. But while before that happens, scarlet has been bottling her beer that she made on the Sail River, the Sail Saison. And I went ashore and grabbed us a dozen oysters or so. So these are pretty big milk oysters. I'm just going to whip some sort of recipe up. What do you think? Chowder. Sure. There it is, chowder. <laughs> Come to Hanover Bay Bars and enjoy their complimentary pedicure service. How's the scenery? The average. I think it's gorgeous. We've got a glass out come to meet us for our departure from Hanover Bay. We decided to stay put for the strong wind warnings. Maybe we should have sailed, who knows. Um, there was supposed to be some breeze today, but this is the Kimberleys. It's a place with no wind. 
It reminds me when I was working as a fisherman over in Queensland, I was lamenting the wind one day and saying that I'd find a place and live there that had no wind. But now, now I own a sailing boat, so my chickens have come home to roost. But anyway, it's a beautiful spot. I think I'll just let the autopilot take over and uh, go and play my banjo lily. Okay, we're about to go and anchor just beneath Bat Island. Doesn't really mean much, but it is an unknown coast, so we don't know whether we're anchoring uh, close to rocks, stuff like that. We'll be able to have a look on the sounder, but um, we definitely want to make sure that we can get our anchor back. So for that reason, we're putting a trip line on the anchor. All it is really is one end is a float going to the surface, and the other end is attached to the anchor. So what I've got here is a stainless clip and that's going to go onto the shackle on the anchor itself and this is going to be at the top. We've written on the float that this is our float and it's an anchor buoy just so people don't use it as a mooring. Um, and because we've got such a big tide range here, it's about 6 metres so not as big as we're used to dealing with but still bigger than usual. We want it to sit above the anchor and not drift away, metres away from where it is. Um, so we've just put a weight here underneath a small pulley and as it goes up and down it'll just self-tension the rope. People that are planning to yacht in uh, a bit busier areas than we are, having your anchor float right above the anchor and not just trailing around getting in the way of shipping, it's a pretty good idea and it's a really easy way of just making a self-tensioning tripping line for your anchor. Some people might not know what I mean by tripping the anchor. The anchor goes into the seabed, it digs in and the boat is pulling it like that and like a plough behind a tractor it goes down into the earth and it sort of holds you. If it gets jammed under a rock or something like that, when you come time to pull it out it won't move. So you need some way of pulling it back out. Use your imagination, the anchor is sitting on the bottom, we've got it stuck, we can't pull it up. But luckily we've got our tripping line coming up to the surface so we can we can ease the tension on the anchor line that's jamming it backwards we can go and grab this line we can attach it to the back of the boat and we can just drive out and it will pull the anchor out by its crown and it'll just come out really easily then we had some issues in uh, the sail river and this may or may not have helped what happened with the sail river is the actual chain got jammed in some rock um, so even if we had a tripping line we might have been able to get the anchor but it still would have been pulling we, we still wouldn't have got that chain up um, and because of the because of the crocodile population in the sail I couldn't just throw on my mask and snorkel and go down there and sort it out like you would on let's say North Queensland or even when we get around to Arnhem Land in the clearer waters if we're outside of the rivers I probably would have done that but uh, you know that sail river was it was dark, it was dirty, and there was crocodiles living there.
Well, the Dolphins dropped us off at Careening Bay, but uh, the local curlews weren't too thrilled with our arrival because they were nesting on the beach. So we left them alone and we went for the object of our visit. Now, here's this crazy tree. It's a boab tree. And back in 1820, Philip Parker King had come and engraved HMC Mermaid, 1820. He'd been given instructions as he was exploring the West Australia coast to leave evidence that he'd actually been here. Careening Bay itself got its name from Philip Parker King as well. And it's because he had to stop here and try and make repairs to his boat. In the broad strokes, when it was built in India, it was constructed using iron nails. Now these were rusting and the boat was falling apart. So he came in, he let the tide leave his boat high and dry, he careened it. And he and the ship's carpenter tried to effect repairs and they were moderately successful um, but the ship was still falling apart so they opted for the incredible feat of sailing back to Sydney all the way down under the southern part of Australia. In this remote corner of Australia we've actually got a boardwalk here. Um, this tree has been deemed so significant historically that it gets periodic visits from a arborist in a helicopter and they put this boardwalk here to stop visitors from impacting the roots. They want it to last for however long boabs last. Our next stop was offshore to Biggie Island, as we heard there were some Aboriginal out there. As we were motoring through the spectacular rocks, we did upset a few osprey who were nesting nearby and they took to the air and were scolding us pretty furiously. From the boat we could see a beach and it had a lot of animal tracks and in particular we could see a really distinct and large crocodile track. So we wanted to go check that out and we weren't disappointed when we got there. A lot of animal tracks were on the beach and it was really great beach combing as well, wasn't it, Pascal? Yeah, I found some really nice shells, especially that pretty pink one. We walked up to the crocodile print and we could really see how he'd been moving on the beach. So that side, casual crocodile. This side, galloping crocodile. <laughs> And along the beach we found this turtle nest and it had a lot of evidence that little hatchlings had popped out because there was tiny little scuttle marks all around it and maybe that's why that crocodile had been visiting this beach, a little bit of a snack. Oh, look, immediate, immediate yeah. art right there. That's really cool. What have you found over there? found a boat with sails. But there's not a lot of detail. So here we see a boat and it's definitely got a sail very reminiscent of a cutter or in any case a European boat. That's cool. See how the noses are like skulls? Mm. You know, they're saying that when they saw Europeans, they thought they might have been... Ghosts. Ghosts from across the Western Sea. So having the pipes there, but the, the heads look like skulls. And have you seen this dude? And here's something to make Pascal happy. Not only was there art in these caves, but also bats. Aren't they blind? No, I don't see that one. Uh. <laughs> All his friends have abandoned him. We've come here to this spot because we saw the paperback tree from the art site um, and we followed the creek bed and a bit of along the rocks. We suspected that there might be water and if you look over here, our suspicions were correct. And underneath my feet, you can feel it, there's water under here. It's very damp and muddy. We tried digging a well further on closer to the coastline and it was smelly, but it was fresh, but... Right here? Here. Got actual... Drinkable water. Tastes a little bit mossy, but... Apart from that, it tastes clean. 
good to go. Yep, surface water, so no need to dig a well here. Paper bucks do it every time. Very jungly. Pasky of the jungle. <laughs> Well, Pasky, all that exploring was pretty hot work, wasn't it? So it was time to go and find a nice croc-free swimming spot. And we found a beach with crystal clear water. That's so good. We left Big Island this morning pretty early and on our way to East Montlivet Island, we came across some reef so we veered off course and threw the lure out and had a bit of a troll around the reef and it didn't take long before we had a Spanish mackerel on the line. Now we want mackerel not barracuda. Oh look he's got a friend. <laughs> oh Oh, the water's so clear. The old Spanish mackerel. Look, look, look. Oh, look wow. Here. Oh, that's a that's giant trevally. Yeah. Far out. Pascal in the middle of a couple of, a couple of turtle tracks. This one looks like it's going up the beach, and then this one's going back to the water. Applying its brake with applying a brake with the tail. <laughs> so there's a turtle track on the beach. How do you know which way the turtle's been going? Join it. The chevrons will point. The tracks lead up to multiple holes here, so the turtles will dig down to a certain depth, and they want to get the right conditions, the temperature. Nice. That's related to those conchs. So that's a that's a spider, a spider shell or a strom. So the big version is those. Good to eat. Noms. So this is definitely a turtle beach. The whole thing looks like it's been dug in for an invasion. So we've come here for a bit of a swim, but we have to remember crocodile safety, and that is always get your girlfriend to go in before you venture in. You've got to really take crocodiles seriously, so just don't go in unless your girlfriend's been in there for a good five, ten minutes. All right? Stay safe. Here we have Pascal getting ready to pick a fight. What are you putting on there, Pascal? Uh, green popper. I'm not exactly sure of the name of it. It's a halco lure. It's a halco rooster, is what it halco is. Rooster. And what knot are we tying on there? Mm, trying to tie a uni knot. Yep, that looks like trouble. <laughs> Tuna? I think so. <laughs> Oh no, I let it go. Oh, chuck it in again, quick. Oh. <laughs> okay, now, so stay calm and just keep the rod so there's always tension on it because there's not much barbs on those hooks. <laughs> oh, it's a queenie. Oh, look at it go. Oh, nice jump. 
<laughs> His cream is going off. You've, I think you've upset him. Look at all the fish down there. I know. We could have a double hook up if we wanted to. 